Hi there. Over on my Twitch channel, link in the description, shameless plug, I was streaming Spire the Dragon 2 Gateway to Glimmer, and a friend and regular supporter Ayakara pipped up and asked why Hunter was naked. And while I had a quippy response at the time, it really got me thinking. Why is Hunter naked? Why do some cartoon characters wear clothes and others don't? Well, I chased this rabbit hole right down to the bunny? Is that really what I wrote? I don't know, I think that was supposed to be... Oh, whatever, just put the title card up. Most of the classic cartoon characters that we know now are from what's known as the Golden Age of American Animation. A period between the mid-1910s and mid-1970s. This period saw the birth of Mickey Mouse and his gang, Fred Flintstone, Betty Boop, Casper the Friendly Ghost, and of course, Bugs Bunny. And despite none of these characters coming from the same franchise, none of them, particularly the anthropomorphized ones, wear full outfits. The humans are dressed, if you can call this dressed. But the animals are either completely naked, half dressed, or just wearing gloves. Let's start from the bottom, the gloves. That, that one's easy. Cartoons started in black and white. Look at the most famous example, Steamboat Willie. It is black and white. So they had to give Mickey's arms some kind of definition against the darker backgrounds. An outline wouldn't work, he'd look like some kind of weird glowy angel. So they popped a white glove on the end of his hand. This would contrast with whatever the black arm blended into, giving the viewer a way of visualising the path Mickey's arm was taking. It also served another purpose, from the mouth of Big Walt himself. We didn't want to give him mouse hands, because they were supposed to be more human, so we gave him gloves. Five fingers looked like a little too much on such a little figure, so we took one away. That was one less finger to animate. It's all about working within the limitations of the time. It's the same reason Mario is designed that way. For those not in the know, Miyamoto gave Mario red overalls and a blue shirt to contrast against each other and the background of the low resolution arcade cabinet screen. His iconic hat was added to avoid having to animate his hair, and his moustache and big nose makes him look distinctly human on an 8x8 pixel head without having to bother drawing an actual face. But back to the mouse. If you want to know more about why they chose those particular gloves, I recommend reading Birth of an Industry, Blackface Minstrelry and the Rise of American Animation by Nicholas Salmond. But that Walt Disney quote, there's a key bit in there that leads us to our next point about half-clothed cartoon animals. Half-dressed cartoon animals, aside from being the name of my band in college, is also the name of a trope that details exactly this. Dive into any cartoon show and I guarantee that you'll see a character with either no shirt or no trousers. Donald has a bare ass, whereas Mickey has his mousy nips on show. But why? Well, it's all about showing the elements of the character in the design. Let's look at Chip and Dale, the Disney cartoon with the second best theme tune of the time period. Chip and Dale kind of have two traits about them. The first is the animal, in this case Chipmunks, and the second is a personality modifier, which in this case is Investigator. So they put the clothes of famous investigators on these animals, in this case Magnum P.I. and Indiana Jones. The clothes tell you that they're investigators without hiding the bits that tell you what animal they are. You know, like the fuzziness, the patterns on the bodies, and you know, the teeth. The, the chip monkey bits. And this is generally the case with most cartoon animals. Donald Duck wears a sailor outfit, I guess, because he swims? I, I don't know, but it, it doesn't hide the fact that he's a duck at all. You can still see his feathery butt and his legs and his beak. This is the case for most cartoon animals that are half-dressed, the exception being Yogi Bear. I had this whole thing written in the script about how Yogi wears a tie because he's smarter than the average bear, because ties are like smart wear and it's, it's a cool clever pun, but no. Turns out that the only reason he wears a collar and tie is so that there's a solid line between his head and his body, so that when they animate him talking, they only have to animate his head and they have a still body cell. It's working smart and I really appreciate that and it's really clever, but I, I wrote a whole thing, man. The only reason they can get away with all this sordid nudity is because of a trend that was established way back at the start of the golden age of American animation, wherein there was only one cartoon dog, one cartoon cat, one bird, one bunny, etc. So you didn't have to do much to differentiate between your duck and someone else's duck, because there was no someone else's duck. And ducks don't wear clothes, so they can just walk around naked with all, and all their feathers can hide the bits that would be the sexy bits if they were a human. 
As cartoons played with this formula a bit more, they did things like have the fur or feathers come off in an explosion, and the character then realises that they're naked then. But more importantly, it kind of normalised the idea that cartoon animals might not need clothing, even if they are vaguely human shaped. If they don't have a specific personality trait or a job that requires them to dress in a certain way, fuck it, make them naked. And Bugs, well, he's a fast talking smart alecky bunny, there's no real clothes for that. So I guess he's just naked. And so is Hunter. Thanks everyone for watching, I hope you enjoyed this video, if you do, uh, leave something in the comments below, and hey, check out my page, wait, 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 what about Lola Bunny? Lola Bunny wears clothes, but why? She's got the same build as Bugs, her fur should count as clothing, right? It's the same rules apply to her as apply to Bugs. You'd think that, but no. Do you remember back when I said that clothes can portray a modifier to a character, like Investigator or what have you? Well, Lola Bunny's modifier is woman. In Space Jam, her first appearance, this was taken in a weirdly sexual way, so her clothes were this skimpy version of the uniform that everyone else wore. But even in later appearances, like in, say, the Looney Tunes show, where there are jobs and buildings and pizzerias, everything is way more humanised and Bugs is still inexplicitly naked, Lola wears a full dress, because Lola is just Bugs Bunny with the modifier woman. And of course this goes just beyond this one furry awakening. In 2017, researchers and linguists Carmen Fort and Karen Eisenhower analysed a gamut of classic Disney films, ranging from Golden Age to modern Disney, and the results showed that there were startling disparity between words spoken by men and words spoken by women in But the reason behind this was that there were a sheer number of fewer female speaking roles in these movies, with some like Tangled and Pocahontas having fewer than five female speaking parts. There's one isolated princess trying to get someone to marry her, but there are no women doing any other things. There are no women leading the townspeople to go against the beast. No women bonding in the tavern together singing drinking songs, women giving each other directions, or women inventing things. Everybody who's doing anything else other than finding a husband in the movie pretty much is a male. My best guess is that it's carelessness, because we're so trained to think that male is the norm. So when you want to add a shopkeeper, that shopkeeper is a man. Or you add a guard, that guard is a man. I think that's just really ingrained in our culture. This goes back to the point I made earlier. Guard is a modifier. Shopkeeper is a modifier. Woman is a modifier. Sidekick is another modifier, a rather popular one at that. Sidekicks are usually people's favourite characters, they have some of the best lines in the Disney movie. But researchers found one example of female sidekicks in all the movies they looked at. Any guesses? Give you a little countdown. Three, two, one. Mrs. Potts from Beauty and the Beast. And don't worry, we'll loop back to around to her, she has her own set of problems. For a more stark example, let's look at the Smurfs. The Smurfs are the most clear example of this. Every single Smurf has one personality trait. There's Papa Smurf, he's the father figure. There's Hefty Smurf, he's big and strong. There's Grouchy Smurf, he's a bastard. And then there's Smurfette. She's the girl. That's a whole personality. She is emblematic of the fact that woman is a modifier. And if woman is a modifier, then that means the default is man. Right, you're talking about movies and TV shows from years ago, that isn't the case anymore. These things have just been, you know, grandfathered into the remakes by trying to be faithful to the source material. Movies and TV shows made nowadays don't have this kind of problem anymore. Eh, not quite, mate. Things don't work like that. These pieces of media were made in a time where women's rights weren't as far along as they were today, but they stuck around and influenced the people that make the movies and TV shows, even subconsciously. Then they go on to make shows and movies that perpetuate this thinking, and it's all just a bit of a vicious cycle. Fortunately, there are creators out there that are conscious of this. On his Tumblr, Raphael Bob Waxberg of Bojack Horseman fame wrote an essay on the topic of gender in comedy, which if you're interested in this, uh, give it a read, link in the underground, it's a really, really good essay. But he found a far more modern example of the male as default in the media. See, now the Lego movie was my favourite movie of 2014, but it strikes me that the main character was male, because I feel like in our current culture, he had to be. 
Now, the whole point of Emmett is that he's the most boring, average person in the world. It's impossible to imagine a female character playing that role, because according to our pop culture, if she's female, she's already something. Because she's not male. Like, the baseline is male. The average person is male. So cartoons need more and better female characters. What does that matter? Why am I arguing for the rights of drawings of women? Well, I'm not. The influence of a TV show doesn't end at the closing credits. If every show on TV and every movie in the theatre portrays men as the default and women as just a personality trait on a blank canvas, then what effect do you think that has on society? If a young girl is shown that she can either be an astronaut, or an adventurer, or a woman, well that choice is already made for her. She's being told she can't be these other things. It's yet another avenue for women to be taught that they're just not as important as men. That men can do all these amazing things and women, well, you're the woman. Remember I brought up Miss Potts earlier and we said we'd loop back around to that? Well, she's the special example. She gets to be the one role that all women get to themselves. The mother. So if you're that little girl in the cinema, you're being told that you can't be a scientist or a superhero, but you can be a mother. In her book Invisible Women, author Caroline Criado Perez surmised why this was detrimental to society within the first few pages. Defining women solely by their relationships to men, as wives, daughters, sisters, or mothers, allows men to view women either as a subtype of men or as an alien other, rather than autonomous human beings with their own dreams, goals, desires, and specific needs. This is what's known as the male as norm principle, which the Dictionary of Media Communications describes as the principle that language referring to females, such as the suffix s as an actress and the use of man to mean human and other such devices, strengthens the perception that male category is the norm and that the corresponding female category is a derivation and therefore less important. And this isn't just some new SJW propaganda. This has been a school of thought in feminist theory since the 19th century. The underlying message they found is that women speak a less legitimate language that both sustains and is defined by the subordination of the female gender as secondary to the male biased normative language, which helps to maintain the systemic bias towards men. To put it simply, they discovered the way that we talk ignores and diminishes women by accepting men as the default, and this has now extended beyond simply spoken communication to mass entertainment. And again, this isn't just me being overly sensitive and trying to justify my media degree. Even TV Trope speaks about how this can and is affecting society. On their page, men are generic, women are special. The trope can be observed in many elements of society and culture. Unisex fashion tends to be built around men's fashion. Jeans and shirts are worn by men and women, but dresses and skirts are exclusive to women in most of the Western world, with the famous exception of the kilt. T-shirts are typically sold in two cuts, women's and men's, but men's shirts are sold as the unisex tees. Many health clubs have considered women's gyms, but never men's gyms, since men are considered the default group and just use the main gym. Most androgynous names, like Jordan or Taylor, started out as men's names. The restroom for a man is just a featureless stick figure, but the sign for a woman is that same stick figure in a dress. In the eyes of society, Male is default, and women are basically men, plus or minus something. So, as the great philosopher James Brown once said, this is a man's world, and there are real, actual life consequences to this. If the demoralization of girls around the world doesn't do it for you, how about this? In 2013, the Food and Drug Administration had to cut the dosage for the sleep aid Ambien in half for women because it left them drowsy in the morning and more at risk of accidents. This is because when they ran the clinical trials for the drug, they filled those trials with generic blank canvas people, i.e. men. It took the FDA 12 years and God knows how many traffic accidents to realize that this needed to change. And this didn't affect just women either. Studies on the pre-half dosage revealed that not only a third of women, but a quarter of men, particularly those shorter than average, also woke up the next day with dangerously high levels of Ambien for driving to work with. And it isn't just Ambien. A study in 2016 regarding serious fainting risk when combining alcohol with Adye, a female libido medication, 23 out of 25 subjects tested were men. Two women. In a study for a drug, intended for women. <sighs> and that's just one of many examples of the male as norm principle negatively affecting the lives of not just women, but men and non-binary people too. But like, what can we do about it? 
This kind of question has two answers, one for the creators and one for the viewers. If you're a creator, you're in a position of power. You can help influence society in a very unique way, so please don't sleep on that. Going back to that Raphael Bob Waxberg essay, he mentions a sight gag he'd written for season one of Bojack Horseman. He speaks of when he described the sight gag to production designer and very cool lady Lisa Hannawalt, who draws both the characters as women. He goes on to say, My first gut reaction to the designs was, this feels weird. And I said to Lisa, I feel like these characters should be guys. And she said, why? And I, I, I thought about it for a little bit. I realized I didn't have a good reason. And then I went back to her and said, you're right, let's just make them ladies. So if, like most of us, you don't have your own personal Lisa Hannawalt to talk about these things, you just have to question your work a bit more. If 90% of the characters in your world are men, ask why. Would anything really radically change if the character plan was shifted slightly and it was a woman or, god forbid, a non-binary person? It may actually make the character more interesting, you never know. Make that one-off barkeep. Make them a woman. Th that astronaut. Make them a woman. Oh, and here's, a, here's a, just a, a special piece of advice for me to you. If you're writing a non-binary character, you can just make him human. We're not all aliens or monsters or fucking faceless demons. But the majority of people watching this video are not cartoon showrunners or writers. And that's fine. I'm not either. But in this current society, we have far less power to reform society than someone in the media does. But we can still do something. We can have conversations like this, we can let more people know, make more people aware of this patriarchal bullshit. We can be aware, we can demand better, we can seek out better shows with more diverse crews, and when we find better, when we find a piece of media that subverts all these terrible topics and tropes, we can scream and shout about them. If there are smaller productions, support their Patreon if you can, subscribes, likes, comments, shares, shows like this need your help. Praise them on social media, tell all of your friends about them, get everybody you know watching this one good show. Shows like, like to bring up Lisa Hannawalt from before, shows like Tuka and Bertie. Wait, cancelled? Ah, oh, fuck this. All right, no, yeah, burn it down, let's start again. Fuck this all. Fuck capitalism. Thank you all for watching. Um, I'm quite liking making these, uh, Vaguely leftist essays, did I fool you? Did you think it was just going to be about cartoons? Nyaaaaa! <laughs> if you liked this video, please, uh, again, like I said, likes and s likes and comments, very, very important for the algorithm and my self-esteem. So if you can, write something very nice in the comments below, that would be lovely. And while you're in the below, you can check the description for the Twitch channel I mentioned at the very, very top of this episode. And my Patreon, like I said, it's very, very important to support smaller creators if you like what they're doing. I'm a smaller creator, and if you like what I'm doing, please chuck a couple of bucks in my pot. I've also got a Kofi link down there if you want to make a one-off donation, but hey, the most important thing you can do today is have a really good day. Continue being awesome. I'll catch you on the flippity-flop. And love you, bye.